Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you because in our lives, we acknowledge you as the way maker, the miracle walker, the one that makes a way in the desert and rivers in the, rivers in the desert and a way in the wilderness. You are the same yesterday and forever. Your power does not wane in our lives but gets stronger. Father, we thank you because as we get to the end of this year, we will look back and I will be able to glorify your name. Thank you, Lord, because you are good and kind to us. You have never left nor forsaken us. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Can we shout the Lord? Hallelujah! Glory together, you may please. Glory to God, you may please sit down. <laughs> glory to God. Can you just do something and just welcome your neighbor to your left and your right with a warm welcome? Give them a compliment. Be honest about it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If we don't find kindness anywhere else, where should we find kindness if not the church? Glory to God. Please can you celebrate with me, my father, your father, the lead pastor, the global lead pastor of Harvesters International Christian Center. Can we appreciate Pastor Bolaji though? Glory to God. And the way we're appreciating him, I'm not sure we're appreciating him. Can we do better than that? Glory to God. Hallelujah. You may please have your seat. May you also appreciate all the pastors with me, Pastor Femi George, Pastor Jerry. Pastor Sonny, and all the leaders as well. Glory to God. All right, let's get straight into it. So we are looking at living with eternity in view. Glory to God. Let's just open very quickly. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17. Glory to God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17. Media. Or is it DJ? DJ, right? Is he here? Media, help me now. Praise the Lord. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with, a tr with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Next verse. Then, which are, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them that are in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we be so shall we ever be with the Lord. Of course, this scripture already um, describes a particular phenomenon in the Bible called the rapture. Glory to God. It's called the rapture. So the rapture is an event that would, of course, um, mark the end of days where um, those that are in Christ will be taken from the earth. Glory to God. And will meet the Lord in the air. Glory to God. And what that says is, what that typifies or what that means is that the world as we know it, as of, as of that time, will come to an end. Glory to God. Now, for the believer, I would like to always reiterate that as a Christian, when you hear about the end time, what should well up in your heart should not be fear but joy. Glory to God. It should not be fear because I know that for some of us that have religious upbringings or have been to certain programs where you saw movies like Left Behind. Praise the name of the Lord. The whole essence was to scare you into Christ. Glory to God. So you see um, movies where the tribulation or where people will be born, where people will be, you know, all those kind of things, tortured, you know, persecuted. You know, so we are saying that those that were left behind will go through the tribulation and nobody wants to go through the tribulation. So for that day, you are afraid. You now say, I give my life to Jesus Christ. I give my, but after one week, you forget until the next session of the movie. Glory to God. But every message about Jesus is good news. And his coming is good news. His first coming was good news. His second coming is still good news. Glory to God. But it is good news to the believer. Praise the name of the Lord. The first coming when he was incarnated is good news to everybody. Because that is the hope of salvation. Glory to God. But that the second coming, right, is not good news to everybody. It's just good news to the believer. 
Because when he comes, he's coming to judge both the living and the dead. Glory to God. But they that are in Christ need not fear. Praise the name of the Lord. You need not fear. Glory to God. But we'll get into that. Now, there are two things about Jesus Christ. The message of the cross is not just a message to believe, but an example to follow. So Jesus Christ's incarnation is not just that he came, you know, to die alone. He also came to be an example. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews where he says, Lo, I come to do thy, I come according, I come in the, according to the volume of the books that are written of me. Lo, I come to do your will. So when Jesus was on earth, he came to do the will of God. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 in verse 5 that he came as a servant. That he did not hold on to his glory and majesty in heaven, but abandoned it and came as what? As a servant. So, and that's what he said to his disciples. He said, I've not come to be a master, but I've come to serve. Glory to God. And that is an example that he has laid down for us. So when you are a Christian, one of the things you need to understand is that by implication, you are a servant. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, we've talked about the rapture. Another event that will occur that marks, also marks the end of days is going to be the judgment seat of Christ or what is called the Bema. Praise the name of the Lord. The Bema. Let's just quickly look at that. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Let's go from, let's go from 9. Let's, let's take it from 9 just to give context to it. It says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted by him. So this is Paul speaking. He says, wherefore we labor. Verse 10. He says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that, that everyone may receive the things done where? In his body, according to that he had done, whether it be good or or bad. So he's saying everyone, when he's talking to everyone here, he's not talking to everybody in the world. He's talking to every Christian because this letter was written to the Corinthian church and was talking to Christians. So he said we must all. So if Paul says we must all, he's including himself in that particular um, um, sphere of people. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when he says we must all appear, he's not saying it's for unbelievers because Paul would not include himself with a non or with someone that doesn't believe in Jesus. So he's referring to all Christians. So he's saying all Christians must appear before the Bema seat. Now, what is the Bema seat? Paul, being a very, um, he was very good with analogies, right? So the, in the Greco Roman period, there was what, what we call Olympics now, always, has always happened. Glory to God. Praise the name of the Lord. What we call Olympics now has always happened. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 25. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 25. Let me just read from here. It says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. It says, and every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Why? Now they do it to obtain. So he's talking about the race. Let me just stop, here, stop there in the reading. So he's talking about a race. So the, the same way they, we, had, we have the Olympics that happens every four years. Paul is talking about their own kind of Olympics. So there were races then. So Paul, being a Roman citizen, of course, seeing what happens in Rome, looking at the sports, of course, observe that these people train themselves. They get on the field. Just think about it. Let's bring it down to our own time. You see people, when they, see, set, they, they, they get to the track and they put their hands down, they say, on your mark, right? The mentality of everybody on that track is that they want to win the gold medal. And that shows in two things. You see it in their face. You see it in their warm-up. You see it in their gesticulation. Have you seen people when they're preparing for track? You see, they're good. They're good. Come back. you see, they are serious. They are focused. They are sharp. You don't go there and see somebody that is preparing to run a race. Gold medal Olympics. 
And he comes and says, how's it going now? What's up with you now? How are you doing? And I says, please, can I have beer? Yeah, just give me one, one, one yeah, yeah. And I say, on your mark. And I say, ah, calm down now. I need to rest, you know. This is not by force, you know. If I win, I win. Nobody does that. Of course, you already know who is losing. Right? Everybody is razor focused on what they are about to do. So Paul is saying nobody runs a race without the prize at the back of their mind. Nobody comes and wants to fight a, a boxing match or wants to, wants, to do a, wants to come into a wrestling match and doesn't want to win. Everybody that competes in a race is competing to win the prize. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's keep going. He says, but they do this to obtain a corruptible crown, meaning that who knows who won fastest man in the world, 1947? Who knows? I don't know if there was Olympics, but just think about around that area. Okay. Who knows? Oh, yeah, 1939. Does anybody know? But you know that they've been doing these things for a long time. But we don't know them. I'm sure if I say even 1984, who was the fastest person in 1984? Who knows? Look, am I? It's Gen Z here. Don't, apart from Gen Z, if you are Gen Z, don't worry. You can't know. Glory to God. What I'm trying to say is that no matter how much gold medal they win, we will forget. As a matter of fact, have you ever heard of sportsmen that they were so popular at one time, one day you now see them on the street begging for money? So that's what Paul is saying. He's saying that that medal, that prize is corruptible. After some time, it will win. He says, but the prize that we are fighting for, the prize that we are running for, he says, that prize is eternal, can never be forgotten. He says, see people that are only gold medal, gold medal that may not be real gold, it may not even be plated, gold plated, maybe they just painted it as gold. I'm just, I don't know. But the point I'm trying to make is this, the gold will fade. But the, re the, re the reward we are going to get is eternal. He says, if those guys, I was watching um, Kobe Bryant on one, um, on one of his um, documentaries, and he was talking about the Mamba mentality. Right? And he, somebody was now alluding to his training. In fact, they, asked, they were asking some, I can't remember, they were asking a particular coach, he said, who is the most hard-working um, basketball player of all time? And the man said, without a shadow of doubt, it's Kobe Bryant. That Kobe Bryant was a beast when it comes to practice. He took practice as serious as he was taking a real game. If I was playing with a particular team, from 4 a.m. he had been on the court. He was playing from 4 a.m. One guy came and joined him at around 5.30 a.m. When the guy joined him, instead of Kobe to be winding down, he now increased. The, both of them went for another hour or two. The guy stopped and left. Kobe was, Kobe was still there. So when they now played the match in the evening, Kobe's team won. The guy now went to Kobe and said, when did you start practice? He said, 4 a.m. When did you leave? He said, maybe like 8 a.m. When did you plan to leave? He said, I was going to leave 6. But when I saw you, I determined that I was going to outwalk you. So the reason why he continued from 4 to 8 was because somebody else came. So he said, if this guy is even practicing at all, I must practice so hard that his practice will not matter when we play the game. Praise the name of the Lord. My brothers and sisters, where is Kobe today? He's gone. He was a great basketball player, great man and everything. But that is not going to matter where he has gone to. Praise the name of the Lord. Everything that we achieve on the, in this world will end in this world. Nothing is transcendent from this world. Only what we do for God is transcendent. So Paul is saying, if you can observe basketball players, if you can observe people like C. Ronaldo, Lionel Messi, all of them training very hard for a crown that, will be, that is corruptible, that will end in this world, how much more you to receive an eternal crown? So he draws that analogy, draws that parallel, saying that if you're going to work for God, don't just look at, don't say anything goes. Say 
compare yourself to a, a professional athlete. Someone that is striving for a gold medal. He says, if you can compare what you are doing with that person, and you can say that this thing, engage, then know that you are doing well. But if it's not, know that you are not doing well. Glory to God. Because when it comes to judgment, for the believer, it is not about sin. When it, and that's what most of us are preoccupied with. Ah, and that's why sometimes we're afraid of the rapture. Because once you just hear rapture, you just say, ah, where's the sin? Which sin did I commit now? Father, forgive me. Forgive me. Bless me. Every sin, future, past, omission, commission. We start praying for that. You don't understand the gospel. Let's read a scripture. Let me read a scripture to you. This will blow your mind after I explain. Isaiah chapter 38 verse 17. Isaiah 38 verse 17. It says, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast what? All my sins behind thy back. Now, the Hebrew word for back there actually means shoulder blade. You don't get it yet. Can I, can I get, my brother, can you come? Please come, my brother. I will show you what it means. See, when you listen to the, the, the biblical authors, when they write some things, they write it so that you can understand. So to us, he has cast, cast it behind his back, so it doesn't mean a lot. Can you come? Can you back the audience? So what he's talking about is somewhere here. Can your hand touch where I am? Try, try, try. Yeah, try. Try harder. Okay, it's getting there. Let me move it up a bit. Yeah, try. 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 What the Bible is saying is that God has put your sins where he cannot reach them. Do you understand what I'm saying? What the Bible says is that God has put, is using a picture to let you know that I have put your sins where I can't reach them. God literally has forgotten your sins. It's not that he's trying to forget. He has forgotten them. The Bible said, blessed is the man whose sin is not what? Counted against him. That means no record of sin for you again. You will see, and that's why some of us, when we go to say, Oh God, that, that oh Lord, that when I committed sin in, in 1922 or in, in 84 or in 95, yeah, I did this, I did that. God is literally looking at you and say, Okay, Angel Gabriel, she said she could open the books and they're looking at it. There's nothing here, there's nothing, everything is gone, it's white. So, for the believer, my brother, thank you because it's becoming awkward. <laughs> Do you understand? So, everything that has to do with sin for the believer that's not the bowl of contention it is the unbelievers that will answer for their sins why because they have rejected the sacrifice of jesus christ i don't have time to explain all that i hope you already know what i'm talking about they have rejected it we that we have accepted the sacrifice of jesus christ is no longer about sin the judgment is no longer about sin the judgment is now, what did you do for the Lord? Before you meet the cross, is about sin. After you pass the cross, is about service. Do you understand what I'm saying? Before you meet the cross, it becomes sin. But as soon as you pass the cross, it's no longer sin, it's now service. It's now, oh, your sins are wiped away. You are now a child of God. You are a child of God, but what are you doing for God? That's what it becomes about. What are you doing for God? See, let me tell you something. I, I want to just announce to you that if you are born again, you are implicated already. You understand? It would have been better that you are not born again, that you didn't know. But as soon as you are born again, you are implicated. You have, there is, a, there is now a record. There's no longer a record of sin. There's now a record of what you have done. What were your, the things you have done for Jesus Christ? There will be a record of it. There's a record. Because most of us just think that's fine. And that's all. Some of us even think that, oh, as long as I'm born again, it doesn't matter. As long as I make heaven, I'll be easy to not to make heaven. Even if they want to close the gate and I just like this. And I enter. That's all. If they like, let them just give me one plot of land here. I should be sitting on the floor. I'm already in heaven. You don't understand. 
when you see Jesus, you will regret that you made that statement. It's because you have not, you, as in by the time you see Jesus face, I don't, you don't know who Jesus is. When John that saw Jesus when he was alive, saw Jesus in the book of Revelation, the Bible says he fell down to his face, fell flat, he could not behold the master. When you see the beauty of his glory, the radiance of his, of his, of his majesty, just think about it. Just think about it this way. So this illustration I'll use. Imagine um, some ladies in, in let's say, let's say Pastor Balaji now just counted some ladies and said, ah, ladies, you want to get married? I'll be single ladies. He said, yes, I'm bringing some guys from a limo shop. Then the girls now say, a limo shop. Pastor, which, is there another... He said, yeah, some guys from Yanopaja, Limo, they are coming. They want to pick their bride. So come on Saturday evening. Do you understand? And come there so that the guys can come. Then some ladies like, ah, Limo, sure. Anyway, we don't know what God can do. They now go and dress their best, put on their lipstick, put, uh, what's this? Bone straight, weave on, whatever it is again that they put. They do everything. They now come. Then some other ladies say, ah, Limo, sure. For, for, for respect for Pastor B, we will go. But I cannot go and kill myself. They now go and wear shimmy. Shimmy? Just shimmy. Or something, you know, tie, not just tie scarf and just wear something, wear slippers and come there. Then as soon as the cars, when Pastor, the guys are riding, you guys see, the first car that comes, G-Wagon. Second car that comes, Rolls Royce. Third car that comes. What would you, do you think that the girls will start feeling? How would they start feeling? You're suffering that, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not ready. I'm not prepared for this. I didn't know that this is what will happen. Then all the guys come out, fine looking guys, one Harvard, one Stanford. They have Isla. Hey! Pastor Bill Nasser introducing them. Then they will now see the people. They will now say, oh, are these the servants of these girls? Do you understand what I'm saying? What will happen is that the bridegroom has come, but they are not prepared. Is that not the same story of the 10 virgins? Some were prepared, but some were not. Glory to God. That's the same way it will happen when Jesus will come. Some of us will be caught unprepared while some of us will be prepared. This is a message to get you prepared so that when he comes, you are ready for him. Because there is such a thing as the marriage supper of the Lamb. Praise the Lord. That marriage supper of the Lamb is when God comes. See, if you read, there are many parables in the Bible where Jesus uses, used to illustrate this. He talks about another parable where he invited some people to come for a wedding and they refused to come. They now said, go into the streets, call all the beggars, call all the poor men, call everybody. And all of them came. And as he went around and began to inspect them to see his guests, he now saw one that was not dressed for the occasion. He now said, why are you not dressed for the occasion? The man was now giving us, he said, cast him out. So where there is gnashing of teeth and regret. God wants us to prepare. There is a preparation that we must do for his coming. And that preparation is not wearing clothes. It's service. Glory to God. It's service. That's what he's going to judge us on. How did we serve? What did we do? Now, remember, I talked about the Bema seat, right? And I said the Bema seat was taken. I talked about Paul looking at the Olympics, looking at his surrounding and using it to illustrate the Bible. So what used to happen in the Greco-Roman period was there used to be um, those Olympics. So when they win, the emperor usually sits on a very high platform. Then all the contestants will begin to go up to receive their prize. Glory to God. So there's usually like a line. They will now call, you know how they call the head. They'll say um, 200, and what do they call those things? What, how do they categorize races? 200 meters, women's or men's or all those categories. Then people now start coming and collect. So there's a line. Just imagine Jesus is about to reward you. And the person in front of you is Pastor B. Just think about it. Let me, use it. Let me explain to you. You wrote an exam. You know you failed. When do you go and check your results? Do you understand? You don't check it when people are there. You wait. In, it's at night. You come in the dead of the night. You know how you start to like, hey, just to confirm the failure. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. That's how we to be in public like this. Angels here. Gabriel here. Michael here. Everybody's there. They've called David. They said, David, what did you do? I did this. I did that. Apostle Paul, what did you do? I did this. I did that. Pastor Balaji, what did you do? I did this. NNP. Souls were what? They'll now say, Brother Thompson, what did you do? Ah. 
Sir. Sir. It was the walk. It was the bank I was walking in. Let me tell you something about God. You can give excuses to any man. You can't give excuses to God. Because for every excuse you have, God has somebody in that same situation that did better than you. Are you aware? God has somebody. There is a weakness of that. So no matter, ah, sir, Lord, I have 22 babies. 20, you, so, see, no matter the excuse, God has somebody. He'll just call somebody, Sister Tina, how many babies do you have? 14. 15. They'll just be telling you the problems that they had and yet. Do you know, this is one of the things, yeah, 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 yeah. I was listening to a, an American preacher preach. And he was giving, he went to China for missions. And when he got there, and they were, this, 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 see the way we are sitting out here, having a message. He can't put in China now. Are you aware? <laughs> they were underground. So he was now talking to them, they praying with them and everything. He was now about to leave. They now said, sir, pray for us. He said, what should I pray? He said, pray that one day we'll be like the U.S. where we can worship in, in open like this. He said, I'm not going to pray for you like that. He said, you must continue like this. He said, why now? He said, because where I come from, where there is free worship, they're asking if there's AC. They're asking if, there's, if the chair is cushion. Is it far? Where is the church? No, I can't go more than three minutes away from my house. You, some of you came... 10 miles, 20 miles, 40 miles. In an average American home, there are two Bibles. One on the shelf, one in the wardrobe that they've never read. These people, you know what they do? They don't have Bibles. So they smuggle sheets of the Bible, sheets, and they rotate it. They say, you, take Exodus. When you read it, pass it to that one. So because they don't know when they will get Exodus again, they memorize Exodus. You don't understand what I'm saying? So when I get Exodus chapter 1, I memorize it because I don't know when it will come to me again. Another person, Corinthians, they, they tear the sheets of the Bible to read. And they are serving God. I'm telling you, see, I went for a conference where there was, there was a pastor. The pastor was coming to give testimony. He's just coming from China. He said, they just released me from prison a month ago for preaching the gospel. He said, but we are going back there. Ah, we are going back there. He said, we are going back there to preach this gospel. To die, is, to, die to, to live is Christ, to die is gain. He said, we are going back there. He was in prison for three months. They released him. He managed to come back to Nigeria. He said, the first flight back to China is going back. You are not here saying, my job, my job, my job. You, you are joking. I saw a video of a church. The pastor was preaching inside Kenu. Kenu, Kenu was in church. It was not a church in China, in the north. Kenu was inside Kenu like this. The members were standing on the chair. Why? Flood. Flood was in the church. Today, today, today. When the pastor was going home, he's the same canoe that took him home. In, Nigeria, in Lagos. Small shower and wind. <clears throat> you change gear. You change the gear. He said, wind, oh, no rain. Just wind and lightning. It's going to rain before. I'm not going to church today. I will watch online. No dedication to the Lord. No service for the Lord. Everything you use and as, a, as an excuse. The Bible says the Lord is looking at you. He says he will test your work. It will be burnt up with fire. And it will see, he will see if it will endure. He will pass the work through fire like this. What is the strength of what you are doing for God? What is your life about? Do you understand what I'm saying? Are you living a legacy that the generation unborn will say, this man fought for God. This man, do you understand what I'm saying? This man worked for God. Because some of us, we have just been distracted. If it's not career, it's family. If it's not family, it's Gucci. If it's not Gucci, it's Bone Straits. If it's not Bone Straits, it's Party. If it's not Party, it's Davido. If it's not Davido, it's Whiskey. Too concerned about earthly, earthly things. But somebody died for you. Are you aware? Bible says you are not your own. You are bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus. Not with silver or gold that is corruptible. But the incorruptible blood of Jesus. Bible says scarcely shall a man die for a righteous man. But Jesus died for us even while we are yet his enemies. He died. 
the men that were flogging Jesus, the men that were beating him, the men that spat on his face, the men that slapped him from behind, that plucked his beard when he got on the cross, said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Why? He was also dying for them. The same men that tortured him, that hung him on the cross and killed him, he died for them. He died their death that they may live. So when you know all that and you are negotiating what you will do for the Lord, it becomes a problem. I said it before, imagine you have a child, you spent money to take them to school, to send them to the best schools in the world, paid thousands of dollars to send them for tertiary education abroad, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and the child now comes back and says, Mommy, thank you for all, all you've done. Daddy, thank you for all you've done. I want to be a shoemaker. You're not like, okay, you mean you want to make like Gucci, you know, you want to say, no, paka, 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 paka. Respect. How do they say those things? They, they, there's a way they call people. They, you know those um, shoemakers that will be, they will hold those wooden boxes. They will not be flicking the, the handle. The handle will be like, paka, 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 paka. Make your shoe. Polish your shoe. He says all the dollars. That's what he wants to go and use it for. So in other words, all what you have invested in him has gone to waste. <laughs> I don't know about you. It's teeth. I will use to finish that child. Teeth, teeth. <laughs> teeth. Praise the name of the Lord. He would have told us before we spent the money. Why didn't he mention it then? It's the same way the investment God has, done, has given you. What are you using it for? To buy a house in banana. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Or to buy Range Rover. Or buy G-Wagon. Or buy Brown Street. Or buy Gucci. Because when we, when we begin to look at it, when it comes down to it, those are the things we are, we are looking for. But compared to it, just think about it. Nothing will follow you into the grave. Are you aware? You will not get to heaven with um, Gucci glasses. Ah, uh. ah, uh -uh, this Gucci is making this place look nice. Praise God. Gucci, so Gucci can come. You are not going anywhere with it. In fact, I'm so sure they may not bury you with the Gucci. I'm sure some people, if they bury you with Gucci, some people come at night, break the grave and remove it and go and sell it. So nothing is following you, even into the grave. Nothing will follow you. So why are you striving so hard for things that perish? You know, there are layers of perishing. iPhone 15 Pro, more Pro Max is out now. Some people have bought it. In September, 16 will come out. You will buy it again. Next year, 17 will come out. You just keep going, 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 going. When will you stop? When will it end? And you know the pressure. By the time you buy 15 Pro Max, once you have 16, some people still say, uh-uh, you're still in 15. <laughs> upgrade, 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 upgrade. You, some people still say, you're still in 15. <laughs> if not for the Lord. If not for what they call it, um, IOS upgrade. My, I'll be my normal, let me not mention the name. <laughs> ah, at least I know that iPhone 6, I used it. I. I use the iPhone 6. I use the 6 out of the iPhone. <laughs> Until they say, I'm not working again. I didn't drop it. I did not care because my identity is not in the things that I own. It's not in the cars that I drive. My identity is only found in Christ. He says, I am complete in him. Complete. Glory to God. Let's quickly look at Matthew before we close. Ask your neighbor, are you serving the Lord? Let's quickly look at the scripture first. Um, Romans chapter 12 verse 11. What, something that Paul said. Romans 12 11. It says what? Not slothful in business, but what? Fervent in spirit. Doing what? Serving the Lord. 
Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. I just want to touch some scriptures to show you how important this is. It says, And that he died for all, that they which live should do what? Should not henceforth live unto themselves, but do what? But unto him which died for them and rose again. He says that he died for you. Henceforth, you should no longer live for yourselves. But unto him that died for you. Is, I don't know if you get the picture. The picture is this. We were slaves sold under sin. Jesus came and bought us with his blood. And now we want to go and do our own thing. How many of you will hire a servant to do something and the person says, you say, please, can you help me clean the house? And the guy goes and begins to cut grass and he cuts it very well. Will you keep him or her? What will you do? Because he's not doing what you asked him to do. Glory to God. Or you get a driver that he doesn't drive you, he just washes tire. When you now say, I can't say, I, I'm not going to drive you, sir. I only wash tire. That's my specialty. That's what I do. If you can see the tire, sir, let me explain the mechanics of this tire to you. You will not explain everything. The tire is actually shining. He did it well. But you need a driver, not a tire washer. Praise the name of the Lord. It's the same with some of us. We've given ourselves our own purpose. We've given ourselves our own assignment. Whereas the air you breathe, you can't give it to yourself. The chest you use to breathe it, you can't give it to yourself. The person that gave it to you, you have neglected him. Some of us even have the gall, the effrontery, the audacity. When they say, come and serve in church, you say, let me pray about it. Ah! Who are you praying to, Shongo? Jesus said, the harvest is plenteous. But what? But the laborers are few. Pray unto the Lord of the harvest that you do what? Send forth laborers. They are not saying, come and be a laborer. They say, want to pray to the person that is working hard to get people. I don't, I don't know. Eh? We just use Christian needs to cover everything. So what's want to be over, more spiritual than God? God said, I need laborers. You say, Lord, I want to know, should I serve in church? He said, I, he said, I need laborers. He said, no. Tell me, should I serve? It goes without saying. The minute you are saved, you serve. It goes without saying. Do you know how many people would have reached if everybody here is serving on the level that Pastor Bologi is serving? Just think about it. Ask yourself this question. If every Christian was like me, <laughs> if every Christian was like me, will the church grow? Will we reach anybody? Just ask yourself that question. If Imagine if Pastor was like you. If you even have adversaries to come to. 35 years. Pastor at home. Thank you Lord for the vision. Thank you Lord for the vision. NLP. There will be no NLP. There will be no harvesters. There will be no HEF. All these things that are blessing lives in thousands. All the people that are. The woman that had. Um, what's that thing? The, 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 she was she, she did not menstruate. And in the service started menstruating. All those things will not happen. God will have to start searching for someone. But in the process of searching for someone, the people that, that his message would have saved the life, the person that wanted to commit suicide, that came to service, and Pastor Baladi preached a message in the fourth service, and the person got saved and did not commit suicide, will come to life at that time. All those people will not have that advantage or will not have that kind of opportunity just because Pastor Baladi did not answer the call, just because he was chasing Gucci. Praise the name of the Lord. You don't know how many lives are tied to your destiny. God is waiting for you to wake up. You don't know the people that are suffering and God has tied them to you. He's waiting on you. They are praying for salvation. And God is saying, I have attached him to Kemi. I've attached him to Bola. I've attached him to Dayo. Once Dayo wakes up, they are going to be saved. Are you aware that Moses kept the um, Israelites in, in bondage for another 30 years? God told um, Abraham that they will only be in bondage for 400 years. But when Moses ran to, to the wilderness and was there for 30 years, they were in the wilderness until Moses received the call. Are you aware? Even though God said it was 400 years, Moses extended the time of their slavery just because he didn't answer the call immediately. So some of us, some of us now, 
We are doing, 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 come and join the workers now. Come and focus on the now. I'm busy. I have a party. I have this. I'm traveling to Dubai. I'm doing this. Have excuse. But somebody is somewhere waiting for your message. Waiting for you to serve. Waiting for you to give. Waiting for you to do something. But you are not doing it. Let me close with this. Let's look at Matthew chapter 25. And I close. I want to show you something. I wish I could read, read everything, but I won't be able to read that now. Matthew 25. So I'll just give you a background. So what happened? There was a man that had servants. Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30. I'm not going to read everything. So there was a man that had servants, and he went to a far country, and he delivered unto the servants talents, right? He gave one five, gave one two, and gave one one. And he went to a far country, hoping that they would do something with the talents. So the one that had five went and traded with the five and got five more. The one that had two went, traded with the two, and got two more. The one that had one went and buried what he had, did not do anything with it. Then when the master came back, the master said, the one that has five, what have you done? Because he was giving account, because Jesus will come to, and we're going to give account. Let me tell you, so, so this is talking about money, but it's symbolic for the gifts that God has given you. What kind of gifts you can talk, some of you can smile, some of you are beautiful, you can, because some, you know beauty is, is evangelism. Just by walking on the road like this, people just say, hey, hey baby, that, that's opportunity for evangelism. Opportunity, but some of you know opportunity for evangelism. Oh, you don't know? You think your beauty is for fun? It's for evangelism. When God wanted to save Israel, who did he use? Tell me now. Esther. Why how did what did Esther use to enter the king's palace? Beauty. It was a beauty. That's why Mordecai told her. Do you not know that you were made for such a time as this? Your beauty is not a mistake. Your, your office that you are in is not a mistake. The resources that you have is not a mistake. The placement where you are is not a mistake. It's orchestration by God to place you in a place to reach people. But no, you are doing Fendi. Glory to God. So he called the second person. He now awarded them and rewarded them and say, oh, you, are, you have been faithful with a few things. He said, now you shall be given many things. He says, enter into the joy of the Lord. He now came to the last servant and I want to show you what he said. What he said to the last servant. He says, and I, it's okay, let me start from verse 24. He says, then he who received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you, did, where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said, wicked and what? Levis, Levis. This used to baffle me. That why does the Lord say wicked? The reason is this. When God gives you things and gifts to use for the benefit of others, but you use all those things for yourself and your family alone, your skills, your gifts, everything you can use to serve in church. Some of us can talk. Some of, There are great preachers sitting down right now here. Yeah. Great preachers of the gospel sitting down right now. There are great evangelists sitting down right now. There are people that have prophetic gifts sitting down right now. Yeah. There are people that can add to church. They are sitting down dormant. They've gone and buried their gifts. They are saying that when the Lord comes, I will just present it to him again and say, Lord, this is what you gave me. Me. The Bible says what the Lord sees is that that person is wicked because if you had used that gift, many people will be saved. If you have used that gift, many people... Do you know how many people have come to me? And I'm not saying this with, by the grace of God. Do you know how many people have come to me and say, your message changed? In fact, this last Wednesday, somebody came to me and said, sir, you're, when I, I'm always in awe. I'm always like, ah, because I don't know. I really don't. It's not when I come here and I say, oh, shatakapakatala, I'm, I'm a blesser. I bless people. I don't know. Uh, a, I don't know. Every time I see, you might think, every, most people think that I'm not always confident. When I come on this stage, I'm saying, God, help me. Let this message read. Because sometimes, let me not talk. <laughs> Even this morning, my wife saw me. She was like, ah, are you not going to pray? I said, I don't want to go to church today. I'm telling you, I'm confessing to you. I said, I don't want to go to church today. But when I sat down to pray, I said, Lord, there are people coming. I don't have a choice. The words I will speak today will change somebody's life. Do you understand? I, I can't just be thinking of myself alone. I feel down. I don't want to go. But I can't think of myself alone. There's somebody that needs to hear a word. There's somebody that needs a prayer. There's a prayer I'm going to raise. There's a word of prophecy I'm going to send. Somebody, God is waiting for a vessel that he will use. So I cannot let God down. I cannot let the, we, Me and God cannot come and discuss later how I feel. But for now, I need to get up and go. 
Because I'm always always saying, you bless me, your word. I can't even remember the word. You did, I can't remember, like, oh God, thank you. And somebody said, it's because of you I stayed in church. I said, thank you. Somebody said, your service, because of your service, I increased my service. Somebody said, because of your giving. In fact, I was in cell one day. I gave some amount of money then, a long time ago. The person used to give small money. Now, so what I give, now I said, ah, I was challenged. I, now I said, giving higher. You don't know the people that are looking at you. You don't know people that can draw from you. You don't know people that God has assigned to you that just by your light shining, they can come to the light. Glory to God. Can we appreciate God this morning? What I want to ask you to do, please, don't harden your heart. Because I know some people, once we say, serve the Lord, you say, I'm not serving. Because sin could tell you someone serve. There's nothing you can say. I'm not serving. Not, no, no, no. See, you only have this one life and this one chance. When you appear before the Lord, nothing else will matter. You cannot give an excuse. Just start. You are afraid of being hurt. It's part of it. Do you understand what I'm saying? You don't want anybody to talk to you anyhow. It's part of it. I won't lie to you. They will talk to you anyhow. They will talk to you. Did, did they not talk to Jesus Christ anyhow? Who are you? Hey, someone just say, hey, ah, you know, say, ah, go ask them. It's, because of, it's not for Jesus. Do you see? Enough. Enough times. But that's why Jesus said we should walk in love. He has given you the command. He says, he says, this is what he says, this, this is what he told the disciples. He said, the disciples, he said, love, your, love one another as how? As I have loved you. He said, there is no greater love than this, than for a man to give up his life for his friend. Why was he saying that? I have given my life for you. Give your life for one another. That's what he's saying. So, drop the reputation. Drop the shoulder pad. Drop the family background. Drop where you walk. Drop it. Nothing will matter in heaven. And come and serve the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord.